welcome in the most beautiful room of the Pathé. Um, I'm the last talk standing between you and food and drinks. I hope you have some remaining CPU and uh, memory power. Uh, I want to tell you a story. A story about myself being a little boy and getting my first computer, the Commodore 64, a famous device. Who started with the Commodore 64? You're as old as me, probably. <laughs> um, this was my first computer at a time that um, not a lot of pictures were taken, so there is no uh, picture of me on my own computer, only a friend of me, and then some other nerds. Um, and we were having LAN parties avant la lettre. They didn't exist yet, they weren't called like that, but we were having fun with computers in a garage. And I can say that that Commodore 64 at that time was better than the laptop, than the Apple that I'm now using. And for one specific reason, you may have noticed in these pictures that there were some strange cables attached to that Commodore 64. I was able to use the joystick port to get inputs into the Commodore 64 and with some other electronics, I was able to control different things. So, at the age of 14, I had my first uh, train network <clears throat> with my Lego train, and I was controlling it from my Commodore 64, and my Commodore 64 knew where the train was on the track with some very stupid, simple uh, um, magnetic switches. And you had this board in between. Huh? So you had this board in between. So everything was connected to this powerful outlets on the back of this Commodore 64. So I was able to interact with the physical world and, and control electronics. Now, let's move forward a little bit. Um, actually, I graduated in film school, so it's for me an honor to be in a cinema. This is uh, the second time I've met my work in a cinema. <laughs> and it's not with a movie, that's a bit uh, ironic. Uh, I went through this whole evolution of, of technologies, web technologies, um, I'm from the generation that made those annoying skip intro flash animations on websites. Uh, you may remember those. But the last 12 years, I've been working with uh, Java. Uh, it started when I joined Televic, a Belgian company who makes these uh, screens that you can find in trains. I think there are some uh, Dutch projects too using these screens. And two years ago, I joined the startup Eve, building a robot. And what is really fascinating is that both are using Java in the back end. So at Televic, we were using Java services to collect real-time information about trains and connections and bring this to the trains, uh, but also for the robots. So the robots were getting firmware updates and interacting with the mobile app through uh, Java services. So no, Java is not dead. Uh, I shouldn't tell you that, I think. Uh, but both is a well-established old company, over 70 years old, and a startup using Java uh, as uh, backend services. Now, um, I joined Azul just before the summer. If you don't know Azul, we built the best GVM in the galaxy. Um, actually, we built two GVMs, so we have a distribution of OpenJDK that you may know is Zulu. Uh, if you are using SDK Man to switch between Java versions, then you will have seen this name, uh, probably. Uh, why I do mention it in this talk is uh, next that I work at Azul, they are all also the only one provi providing distributions that you can use on the very first uh, versions of the Raspberry Pi uh, with an uh, older processor. Uh, we also have at Azul an uh, other distribution of OpenJDK. It's based on OpenJDK, but it has some other implementation like another garbage collector um, and other tools. And the idea is here that without any code changes, we are able to have higher throughput, lower latencies, uh, that kind of uh, things. And yesterday we uh, announced a new project, which is Azul Vulner Vulnerability Detection. It's a very difficult world, word. <laughs> um, there are a lot of tools to make sure that your Java code is secure. Uh, we want to fill in a, a missing link, uh, and that is the production side, that you are really aware, am I running a dependency or am I using a dependency uh, in my production system which has become vul vulnerable? So like Log4j and all these uh, things that happened in the last year that you are aware of those. Uh, now that's all the marketing I'm gonna do for Azul because you're here for the Raspberry Pi. Now what is the Raspberry Pi? It's an amazing board. 
It's a very small board. It's very big on the screen, but actually it's uh, 10 centimeters uh, in height. Um, it is a full PC in a small form factor. And the idea behind the Raspberry Pi project was to bring computing to everyone in the world. So the very first Raspberry Pi boards uh, also had an analog uh, video signal connection, so you could connect the Raspberry Pi with a regular television. With the idea, everyone already has a television, so let them give them a very cheap uh, computer. So you have them in, in different ranges, at uh, different prices, um, the most important thing to remember is that depending on the number of connections that you want or, or need, you have different options. Uh, the compute is a special one. If you are building a, a hardware project, uh, for instance, uh, you want a washing machine with a very uh, uh, extended control system and a screen, you can use the compute. The idea is that you plug it in in an, uh, another designed hardware board where you have the physical connections the connections that you really need for your project. Uh, there, are very, uh, there are 32 versions available of those computes, depending on the uh, memory, wireless, all those things. Um, but look at these prices, the zero. This, the latest zero that they released um, is 15 euros. It has a half a gigabyte of memory, but I have projects running on it with Java, with JavaFX, so building uh, user interfaces, 15 euros. That's a very low price if you want to start experimenting with um, HMIs, devices that you want, uh, touchscreen uh, applications, that kind of things you can build with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, for completeness, I want to mention the Raspberry Pi Pico. That's something that was released uh, recently. Um, if you are familiar with electronics and you have used Arduino before, that's the kind of thing you have to compare it with. It's a microcontroller, it's not a PC. Um, also a version with or without Wi-Fi prices, four and six dollars. If you want to start experimenting with uh, electronics, this is really uh, the way to go. Now for completeness, what is the Raspberry Pi? It's a single board computer. You can run many different uh, distributions of Linux on it, so it being both a server or a desktop version. Um, if you go to um, awesome Raspberry Pi on GitHub, you will find a lot of operating system distributions, uh, gaming machines, uh, a NAS system, uh, a long, long list of things you want, can experiment, and both in 32 and 64-bit systems. So the latest Raspberry Pi B B4 has eight gigabytes of memory, Therefore, you need a 64-bit uh, operating system. Um, and they make 400,000 pieces of them. Now, uh, even then, with this big number, there's a big, big shortage of uh, Raspberry Pis. Who has a Raspberry Pi at home? At mill? Wow. And who is using it? You have a piece of gold in your hands or in your drawer. Take it out. Use it. Um, if you don't have one, go to rpilocator.com because the prices you saw on that slide before, those are the official prices. Uh, just like with any other piece of electronics, at this moment they get all uh, bought very quickly with bots and I don't know which kind of systems these people are using and then they try to sell them for tw twice, try triple time the, the same price. So go to an official website, official uh, dealer, they are all listed on RPI Locator and you will see who has them in stock. Now it's a really powerful device even for this low uh, price. I have been writing a book, I have been doing a lot of experiments about Java and Raspberry Pi. I was using uh, a uh, Raspberry Pi 4 with a 4K display attached to it. Um, so I had two Visual Studio codes open, I had Arduino open, I had a terminal, I have my file explorer. Everything works on a 4K display and you can attach two of them. So that gives you a lot of power, a lot of desktop uh, to work on. Now also, um, based on this Raspberry Pi 4, the Raspberry Pi 400 was released. Um, and it's actually a Raspberry Pi 4 that they have cut in half and then stretched a little bit and they put it in a keyboard. So this gives you, again, a very good starting point if you want to start experimenting. Now, this reminds me of something. It has the same multipurpose port on the back, 
and it's a keyboard with everything in there. So you just connect a display, a power supply, a mouse, and you can get started because we feel on board. Now, if you compare it, um, the most painful thing for me here is the 37 years. <laughs> um, but also important here is the price. If you compare the evolution that what we went through, so if you recalculate the price of a Commodore 64 to the current price, it would be around 1,500 euros. And you can get started with Raspberry Pi or Raspberry Pi 400 well below 100 euros. So you have a lot of memory, a lot of computing power uh, to experiment with. And most importantly, these are the things to remember. Those 40 pins, that's what we will be using uh, in this talk. That's where you connect LEDs, buttons, but even many more things. Now, there are a lot, a lot of uh, very fun, uh, amusing projects going on with Raspberry Pi. Um, I think this guy has the best job in the world, Chris Benson. He works for Oracle, and his uh, job is create fun projects to demonstrate our technology. So he built a cluster, and there are 1,060 Raspberry Pis inside this rack. Uh, it dates from just uh, before Corona, so it's Raspberry Pi 3. I don't think he will replace them with force because uh, shortage. And, uh, um, and he sent me this other picture. I have no clue what he wants to build with it, but it looks like some kind of phone boot with, with uh, Raspberry Pis. Uh, another project by Ivan Koleshov from JetBrains. Um, so this compute module, I was telling you, you have to make your own hardware where you uh, plug the, com uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, compute board on. So he made this blade, and in this blade you can have an, uh, a memory uh, uh, hard drive, uh, you have some connections, and then he has some housing that you can have four of them, but uh, he also created um, a rack unit where you have 20 of these boards next to each other. So then you can get started with Kubernetes and, and cloud clustering stuff uh, on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, of course, again, with 3D printing and everything involved. So the whole maker thing is coming together in these uh, Raspberry Pi uh, projects. Um, now, you might ask why would I use Java on the Raspberry Pi, because the Pi of Python comes from the number Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi, comes from the number Pi, but also from the language Python, because initially it was the idea, let's make a computer that you can use with Python. Um, I'm not here to blame Python, um, just Java is my language. Eh? Um, I was used to work in Java, and I wanted to explore new territory and start experimenting with uh, electronics. So I wanted to control all these devices, so you have such an LCD display or a LED matrix, or uh, I want to measure the temperature with a sensor and show it in a graph. Was I going to be able to do that with Java? That was actually my question. And now, um, another argument for Java on the Raspberry Pi or on other, any other device is the energy efficiency. Um, this is not uh, a test by a Java lover, but this is in, uh, um, from, from one or another university. Um, so they compared all the languages and they did a similar function. If I do this similar function, how much energy do I need? And C is the reference. And then you see that Java uses almost twice the energy, but Python uses 76 times the same amount of energy. Of course, every language is evolving, is becoming more efficient, but these are numbers to keep in mind uh, also if you scale uh, your uh, hardware for any other projects. Um, I'm a big Java FX lover. I don't know who's using Java FX. It's not that much. Very pity, but I love it more than any JavaScript based uh, framework to build user interfaces. Java FX allows you to build very uh, beautiful user interfaces with different stylings, like if you want to create business applications or dashboard applications or even games with FXGL. Um, a lot of possibilities are there, a lot of uh, libraries that you can use, free libraries of course, this is Java, and there's a very uh, big and great community behind it. Um, but not, also, not only for Java FX, there's a big community, there's a big community for everything about you see it here at this conference, all the people you can talk to here, uh, all the people that share their knowledge and what they have been experimenting with. Um, I want to, if, if there's one uh, link you keep 
uh, you remember from, from this talk, then let it be fuji.io, who has already been on Fuji. Okay, we have some advocacy to do. <laughs> um, Fuji is a, a website started by Azul, but it's by and for the OpenJDK community. Uh, Fuji stands for Friends of OpenJDK. Uh, every day we share an article here. Uh, a lot of the, talk of the speakers of this conference uh, also have content on this uh, website. Um, but I've been also uh, adding a lot of Raspberry Pi related content uh, there. And if you see what you can do on a Raspberry Pi, it are exactly the kind of technologies and things you learn at conferences. Uh, I've been using creating a user interface with Vaden to interact with a LED eh, or a button to read the state of the button. Uh, Gbang to run single file uh, Java application without the need uh, to use uh, Maven or Gradle. SDK man to switch between Java versions, um, JavaFX. So all these technologies, they are available, and of course, it's right once run everywhere, and that's also true for the Raspberry Pi. The evolution, we have a big evolution in Java since we have the six month release cycle, and we have all these new versions very short after each other. Each one brings improvements uh, also for embedded, also for the Raspberry Pi, the same for JavaFX. Uh, Glue on the team behind Java VIX together with the community are making improvements in Java VIX and in Java to run smoother and better on embedded. Um, and as I said, I wanted to learn a new thing and that's actually uh, a good goal that you should keep in mind is focus on one thing. I focused on the electronics and getting to know and to understand how to interact with these uh, components. So uh, three years ago, I had this idea. This is my son, this is his drum boot. You hear this can make some noise. Um, so we have a boot and you have a, a touch screen interface, JavaFX. We have the Raspberry Pi with Relays. There is an Arduino to control uh, the LED strips at the ceiling. And of course, yeah, um, it's a Java project, so I added an extra dependency. There is undertow in there, so there's a web server. That means that his drum boot has an API, and with the API, I can uh, give him a red light signal, so he has to stop drumming and come down. <laughs> so we can do that from everywhere in the house. So that was the idea. How do I build this? Um, oh, I always forget it, so I added the slide. Um, you will make a boy very happy if you subscribe to his YouTube channel. <laughs> Um, how to build this with Java, that was my idea, my goal. So the next six months, this was the fourth member of the family. This little uh, drawer was uh, in the house uh, and I had a small component that was experimenting and I was writing down how I uh, finished this project and then I moved on. So now it's this LED kind of display that you have in a clock. Um, and then, yeah, and another component and another component and I ended up with a book. Uh, I also started writing for Fuji, um, and the idea was with the book to go to conferences. Uh, I forgot one thing, and that was a virus. <laughs> so uh, this book was finished just before uh, COVID. Uh, I'm the king of bad timing, I probably. Um, but now I'm here, and because we are two years later, uh, the ebook has been updated uh, with Java 17 and later, and other evolutions in this topic. Now during this. Um, my experiments, I got into contact with Pi4j, the project, and the creator of it. Um, and Pi4j, uh, I follow the course about storytelling, and I'm allowed to have one slide with too much text. That's the one. Um, so what is Pi4j? It's a friendly object-oriented API with libraries for Java programmers, like all of us, to expose the full API I.O. capabilities of the Raspberry Pi platform. And the goal is that you can focus on, I want to program something and not really need to fully understand what's happening behind the, the scenes with all this electronics and how this interacts with these pins. So if you have your Java application, you have a dependency on the Pi4j library. The library will expose or open uh, these pins for you. And in between there is GNI uh, talking to some C code that really interacts uh, with the GPIOs. This project was started by Robert Savage uh, already in 2012. He was at DevOps in 2014, 
Um, he moved on a bit, but actually the Pi4j project, the team behind it grew. We have uh, different people joining. It's an open source project. It lives on GitHub. That means that everyone can join. Uh, we have people now creating a lot of examples recently and just adding them as uh, example code in GitHub, but also adding them as uh, documentation uh, to the website. Uh, there are two versions of people who have been working with Pi4j uh, late, um, some years ago. They have been using version 1. Uh, version 1 um, went very broad. It supported a lot of components inside the libraries that made it very difficult to maintain and to extend and to keep it uh, tested. So actually version 2 has been redesigned. It went back to the core, really the, the GPIOs um, and the implementation for specific devices has been taken out. But also, yeah, we moved on uh, in Java version, of course. Uh, also in the native library, which has, uh, is included in the library, wiring Pi has been deprecated for several years now. So we have other systems there. And also the pin numbering, there was a lot of confusion with uh, how you number these pins. There is a physical number from 1 till 40, but then there's another numbering used to address these pins. Um, and now we are on Java 11 uh, and all. Um, if you want to understand these 40 pins and what they are and how they are numbered, uh, there is this great website. I see that my slides are a bit more formatted for the screen. Pinout.xyz. So you have their uh, representation of these pins and how they, uh, what each pin means and if they have a specific function or a general function. But I also have a sneak preview for you. It's api.py4j.com. Actually, the idea is here that we uh, provide a way uh, to request to a service uh, what is available uh, as a PIN, uh, if there is some extra information available. Um, as I've said before, it is, uh, uh, Vaden is one of the things that you can use here. So this is a Vaden uh, web user interface on top of it. Um, it gives you a view of these PINs. Uh, and of course, because it's Java, and it's spring, you can uh, just as well add uh, a Swagger interface and JSON outputs. So um, have a look at it. And the fun thing is it runs on a Raspberry Pi, of course. It's hosted by a Czech company uh, on a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, some real world examples uh, that I've taken from the Pi4j website. Uh, it's a medical sorting uh, system where a Raspberry Pi is used to control this whole sorting of medicines. Uh, and also this cabinet. And the fun thing here is this is a cabinet that they use in hospitals, in the pharmacy. So if they start collecting medicines for a specific patient, then the lights turn green in the drawer where the medicine is and where they have to pick it out. And if they put their hand in the wrong drawer, then it turns red. So they're really guided to avoid mistakes with uh, medicines. But also uh, some very fun projects, uh, that's Didier, the street robot. He's part of a street artist act, uh, and inside are Raspberry Pi and a lot, a lot of wires and Raspberry Pis and speakers and LEDs and screens and stuff like that. So all driven by Raspberry Pi and Java. I keep that in mind. Now, uh, as part of the Pi4j project, we created Pi4j version 2. We also created a new website. Uh, the goal of this website is to provide you with all the information related to Java and Raspberry Pi. Uh, not only for the pins and how you use the Raspberry Pi, but also, for instance, uh, running Java VIX applications in kiosk mode or in normal mode. How you do that, it's all documented here. And we add uh, re regularly uh, new examples of uh, specific applications that you can build with components. Now, one of the examples that uh, is used many times is the minimal example. Uh, Hello World is the getting started of every programming language. For electronics, it's blinking a LED. It's the first thing you will do if you start with Arduino or, or with the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's also the first thing you can do with the Raspberry Pi and Pi 4J. So what we have here, we have a LED, which, uh, a light emitting diode, which is connected to a Raspberry Pi and we have a small button. And the goal of this example application is if you, uh, the, the, the LED starts blinking, if you click, click the button, it starts blinking a bit faster, and after five times, uh, the application stops. So how do you create such a thing? You need a few dependencies. They are all listed, uh, of course, on the website. Uh, you need a context. 
Py4j context, so it will load the uh, libraries and then uh, know how, to, how it can interact with the GPIOs. And then you just configure it with a config builder. So you see very, th the things you know from Java, the things you use in every application you build in Java, it's the same approach that is used here. You have some properties to be configured and then you can start using this let when it has been created with this configuration. So turning a let on and off becomes then a let low and a let high. So you're interacting with Java objects. You're not interacting with electronics. It's really the let has become a Java object. If we run this application in the background, you see the output of the Java application. Don't mind the very big fan. It's the only gift I ever got as being a Java and Raspberry Pi influencer. Voila. So, button has been pressed five times, the application stops. So this is the very first thing you can create uh, with the Raspberry Pi and Pi 4J. If you buy yourself an electronics starter kit, you will find them on eBay or everywhere for 20, 30, 40 euros. You will have a lot of these uh, LEDs, resistors, buttons, distance sensors. They're normally part of such a starter kit. Um, so buy yourself one uh, as a Christmas gift and start experimenting. Now, um, let's build something uh, more complex. This was just a getting started thing. Um, this is the ID. Let's build a dashboard, and in the dashboard, show the results of different sensors. So on top you see a crow pie, I'll show you in a minute. So this device is sending data from different sensors to a messaging system, and the other application, the Java VIX application, is receiving these messages and showing them in a dashboard. So we're going to use a crow pie. Um, Again, I'm not promoting anything, it's just one example product. I have them with me. Um, what is a crow pie? Actually, there's a Raspberry Pi inside. But what's more fun is uh, there's a lot of components inside. Um, fun story, I went to my new colleagues in Prague a few weeks ago, and I didn't dare to take this with me on the plane, because it looks very much like a bomb. I was telling this just uh, to some colleagues, and they were saying, yeah, make it worse and make it count down. <laughs> you will never leave the airport again, <laughs> which is probably true. Um, I have prepared a very, very little demo. Let's see if this works. I will show you the code first. Um, so there are a lot of components inside here. Uh, thanks to a Swiss university, FHNW, um, where they use Java, Java, VIX, Raspberry Pi, Pi4J to learn uh, both electronics and programming. Uh, a few of these students made a project last year where they made an application for each sensor and each electronic component in here. They are all documented on the Pi4J website. Um, of course, the project is shared on GitHub, and you see they have application, infrared receiver, LCD display, LED matrix application. So they have all... Um, demo example applications to show how you use this kind of devices. You don't have to use them on a crow pie if you have uh, the document on which pin they are connected. So if you can just replicate this with the same components uh, on a breadboard, or uh, you can get started with these examples. So if you run this, and actually I have it now running on this crow pie, the problem is they forgot to add the connection for the second screen, so I cannot attach it to the big screen. Um, that's why I have a screenshot. So you'll see all these applications being listed if you start this application. And I'm, I'm going to use the buzzer app. There is a little buzzer here. And this buzzer is controlled with a PBM signal. So this is one of those new things I learned during my experiments. What is a PBM signal? So that's just turning the pin on and off. But depending on the speed and how long it stays on, you get a different signal. So you can turn a LED to be bright or very, uh, very low brightness with that kind of signal, but you can also control a buzzer. Um, so what they do with this buzzer component, you see we have a PWM config builder that we need here. Uh, it needs an address, so in this case it's uh, connected to pin 18. Uh, 
A hardware PBM, a hardware that means that it's actually a component inside Raspberry Pi that controls this PBX, PBM signal and it will be very stable. If you do it from software, it can get uh, blocked by garbage collector or any other Linux op um, uh, application in the background. Um, and then we can play a tone. So we have this buzzer component that they created, uh, this code. So it uh, expects a frequency and a duration and will uh, put this PBM signal to a certain value. Now, with this buzzer component, they created the buzzer app. And in the buzzer app, you have an array with notes and an array with tempos. You could also combine this into a record, a record now with Java 17, I think, but that's how they programmed it. Uh, and then with these two arrays, we play all these notes. I'm not going to show you any rocket science today. So it's the last session. We cool down. We make it very simple. And we get this. I hope you hear it in the back. It's a very simple demonstration again, but it shows you how easy it becomes as a Java developer to use the knowledge that you already have and combine it with electronics. So this was the first step. We go to messaging. I guess most of you already use messaging in some uh, way. So we have applications sending data to a post box. And on the other side, we have other applications who can also send data, or they can subscribe to this post box and get the data that is delivered in this post box. And that's what we're going to use to connect different Raspberry Pis. It's the same thing you can use at your home if you want to have sensors sending data and show, use them somewhere else. Of course, you don't need this whole flow, but we as programmers, we love to make things complicated even in our homes, and that's one way uh, you can do this. Um, one uh, approach you can use is Mosquito. Mosquito is such a post box. It's an application that can deliver these messages between different applications, and you can install it on a Raspberry Pi. So you, you could use a Raspberry Pi inside your house to be the post box and connect different uh, devices. Installing Mosquito is just sudo apt install Mosquito and Mosquito clients. The clients is uh, something you install for testing, and that's what you see in the screenshots below. So you have Mosquito uh, Publisher, and the publisher can send a message to a specific post box, a topic, and the other one subscribes to a topic, topic and shows you what is received. Um, I use this while writing my book uh, to also create a little JavaFX application that becomes part of these programs that interact with this post box. All these uh, examples and documentation and uh, applications that I created for my book are shared on GitHub. You will find them under my name and then Java on Raspberry Pi. You see them divided by chapters. So if you buy the book, you will find them back very easily. It's a little tip. Um, but I also want to show you an alternative. So if you use Mosquito on a Raspberry Pi, that means that you lose a Raspberry Pi and that you have to keep it alive, of course. And it can become complicated to connect it to the outside world. So if you want to have messages flowing through different uh, locations, then that can become problematic. HiveMQ is a possible solution. It's a Java-based MQTT broker, so it uses the same communication protocol. Um, but it's a Java-based application. It is uh, an open source uh, project that you can also buy a licensed version with more options, but they also have a cloud solution. And the fun thing about this cloud solution is that it's free for up to 100 clients. So even for the most enthusiastic maker, uh, that's quite a lot of uh, devices to send data. Uh, go to HiveMQ and you'll find the HiveMQ cloud option there. Uh, and then you just create your cluster there you find the address on top, that's the address you will uh, need uh, when you define your connection string. Um, and you can even make your own credentials, that means that you can use different credentials if you have different devices. And they also have a WebSocket uh, web test page. So if you again log in with the same credentials that you created for one of your applications, you will see the messages passing by on the website. So that's a very Good starting point if you have one device that starts sending data 
you can go to this website and already see this data coming in, so you're sure that that part of the job is already finished and working. Now for this whole HiveMQ, there's a different project uh, on my GitHub repository where you will find all uh, these sources. Now, one side is we want from this device to send sensor data to this post box. Um, I'm using the HiveMQ Java library. Uh, there are others. I think Paho is, is another well-known one. Uh, I love HiveMQ, the library, because it allows you to very easily configure the whole thing and connect to it. So we just need the server, a username, and a password. Then we define the client with the builder pattern again. We have some values that we have to provide there, an identifier to make sure that we have a unique device sending data or a unique identifier for the device. And we have a connection that we have to make on top of that client. And as soon as we have that client, so it's just providing a username and password. We can also have options to automatically reconnect. That's also part of this uh, library. And then we can just send a message. And sending a message is just a string. So it's up to you. You decide what you send to this post box. Is it a string, a JSON formatted as a string? Is it a number that is sent out as a string or through a Boolean? You can send whatever you want. It's just up to you to decide how do I handle my data. In my example, I'm also always using JSON. But of course, we need data to send. So we need data from one of these uh, sensors. So in this example, it's the motion sensor. There's also a little motion sensor here uh, so that you can see if someone is waving a hand on top of the uh, computer, for instance. So this one is connected on pin 23. And then we have, again, some uh, configuration to be done uh, uh, same way with the config builder that we've seen before with the delete uh, and, and the buzzer. So it's the same approach coming back and coming back. So you see it's always Java code to interact with these components. And the fun thing that these students did was also add some uh, states. So based on the state for each type of sensor, you can have specific functions. So here we're sending a simple event uh, when it was moving or when it detected a stillstand. So when we run this application, on top of you, you see the CrowPy 1. It's not only this motion sensor that's used in this uh, demo project. It's also uh, a tilt. Every second, you will see the temperature, uh, the distance. There's a distance sensor. So if you have your hand on top of it, also this distance sensor will be shown. And then the data that has been sent is validated on this WebSocket test page. So you see all these values coming in. They have uh, specific topics. So in noise topic, in uh, other topics, they are also there in the log output. So we have a sender. So it's just a Java project that's able to read from different sensors of this device or from any other device that you built around your Raspberry Pi. And you are able to send structured data messages to a broker. Now, if we combine this on the other side with JavaFX, then it becomes very easy to create a dashboard. I'm using the TilesFX library by Gerrit Grunwald. That's now a colleague at Azul. <laughs> um, by the way, if you ever create a library like this, it's a good idea to use your own picture as an example, so everyone knows who you are. That's Gerrit. Um, so he created this library. And you see these are all different tiles with a specific use case. So you have gauges, you have graphs, you have even a world map. It's up to your imagination how you use them, but they are all available to be tailored uh, according to your needs. So if we create a second project to run on another Raspberry Pi to show the data, then again, yeah, we need the same thing. We need first the hive MQ, so the MQTT connection, the client, that can connect to our broker in the cloud, and that can handle these messages. So instead of a subscriber, it will uh, instead of a publisher, it will be a subscriber. So it will receive the data uh, from the system. And then we have tiles, and each tile will be linked to one of the values of the data that's being received. So we have a sensor switch, so that's just a toggle thing that you can change. 
and it's a tile builder of the skin type switch. It has a width and a height, and then we handle a specific message. So we subscribe to one topic, and each message that is received in that topic will be handled and converted to a value, and this value will be used to have the status tile active or inactive. So that's the other side, where we connect to uh, the queue, get all these messages, and show the output. Now, in this application, we are using more than just uh, the swish sensor. There's also a, a gauge for the temperature, a percentage for the humidity, and so on and so on. So all these tiles are being created and linked to this, uh, to this data. And again, I have a small movie to show you here. So again, on the right side, on the top, you see the sender application. And what you now see in the log output is the data that's received on the other side, on the client application. So you see all these tiles, right? On top you have uh, the distance sensor, so if there's no hand on top of it, the distance between the desk uh, and, and my, my ceiling is 1 uh, 160 centimeters, that's about the size of my desk. Um, so all these values, the humidity in the room, if, if the thing is being shaken, all these values are flowing between one side and the other. Now, of course, this is just an example application. I used uh, the work of these students that they created as a demo for this device to create a demo of what you can do with messaging and how you can uh, show these kinds of values. Uh, by the way, this video is looping, so I can just leave it length. <laughs> um, this is my introduction to Pi4j and what you can do with it. Uh, what's next? If you follow me on Twitter, also on Mastodon, eh, we have this whole evolution of people moving to Mastodon since a week. Um, I'm there. I'm tweeting and writing about Java on Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can find me also on uh, fuj.io and pi4j.com, where you find a lot of information about this topic. And I have my own blog. If you visit the blog, you will uh, see that all the links of this presentation are there available uh, in uh, the second post. And I invite you to experiment. Um, fail and learn. I failed a lot. I burned some electronic components. I didn't burn a Raspberry Pi. It's pr pretty hard. I tried by accident, but I didn't fry one. Um, so they're pretty strong. But yeah, you will lose some components, but luckily these electronic components are very, uh, very cheap. So learn and have fun and maybe read a good book. And I thank you for being here. Are there questions? The sense hat, not yet. Uh, there is a whole Python library, I know. We have been experimenting, but um, of course I invite you to join the project and become a contributor. Um, that's what's happening now. So we focused with Pi4j version 2 on just the GPIO interaction. Uh, Tom Arts, who joined the project, is someone who retired, has been building, I think, rockets, but is now focusing on experimenting. And he writes examples for each kind of chip, like uh, analog to digital conversion. Um, so if there's someone who has been creating a Java project for a sensor head, for instance, uh, is very welcome to contribute it, yes. Someone else? Then I think there are some drinks waiting. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>